You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Military technology is a fascinating topic, whether you are talking satellite-killing missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles, reactive armour on tanks, or, a favourite of mine, precision-guided artillery munitions. One of the military technologies that seems to be a standard for soldiers around the world is often overlooked, though. This technology is actually older than most of the headline-grabbing gadgets, but it's far more ubiquitous on the battlefield. It is, of course, small arms. And I don't mean the type sported by a T-Rex. I mean rifles, pistols and the like. G'day listeners and welcome to another episode of the Dead Prussian Podcast, your favourite podcast named after a Prussian theorist, kind of. My guest today is Dr. Matthew Ford, a lecturer in international relations at the University of Sussex. He has a PhD from the Department of War Studies at King's College London, an MA uh, from the same department, and a BA Honours in Philosophy from the University of Reading. After completing his doctorate in 2008, he joined the UK Civil Service as a strategic analyst with the UK Ministry of Defence. Matthew has published in a number of journals, including the Journal of Strategic Studies, Small Wars and Insurgencies, War in History, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, and a good favourite of the show, Parameters. A former West Point Fellow and winner of the Society for Military History's Russell F. Weigley Graduate Award, Matthew has written extensively about military technical change, especially as it relates to the infantry and their experience of battle. Matthew is the founding editor of the British Journal for Military History, but most importantly to me, he's the author of Weapon of Choice by Hurst & Co. London and Oxford University Press. This book was released, well, this year, a couple of weeks ago. Jump on Twitter, you will see it. It is uh, in one person's feed in particular. Matthew, thanks for coming on the show. Hey Mick, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be uh, joining you. I know it's first thing in the morning for you, but um, I'm ready for a beer, so... Uh... Should we crack that? Uh, when it, however you want to crack on. We will crack on, uh, mainly because it's a heat wave here and uh, my very, very sophisticated equipment that's already uh, starting to shut down is uh, keeping me nice and warm at the moment. Now, you've written about the development of small arms, you're focusing mainly on the innovation and technological advances. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got interested in defence studies and then, in particular, the weapon of the infantryman? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, I think, I mean, um, I, I decided I wanted to do a PhD um, a few, about 15, 20 years ago. And uh, I was always interested in military related stuff. Uh, and I'd spent the last, I don't know, five, six, five years working for a management consultancy. Um, and I worked a lot on IT strategy and their, with their uh, um, and uh, and how to actually implement technology into businesses. Um, and I wanted to see whether I could uh, take my interest in military related stuff and uh, work it back through into what I knew about the more practical end of these things in terms of. Um, consulting and businesses and all the rest of it. And um, so that was my starting place. And what I realized was that um, when you're a consultant, there was always, uh, when you're working for a management consultancy, the, the challenge was to um, identify technologies that you were at two ends of the problem, really. There were engineers that had solutions um, and there were users that had demands, they had problems. The question was, which one led in the discussion? Did the engineer go to the user and say, look, I've got this great bit of kit, uh, this will solve your problems. Or did the user say, look, I've got this problem and go to the engineer and say, you know, I've got this problem. Would you um, help, you know, solve it for me? Uh, and that was my starting place um, on all of this in terms of, a, and I was just thinking it through in terms of um, the background I'd had from management consultancy. Uh, and I went to my a potential supervisor. And I said, look, you know, I want to explore this problem, but I need a viable technology to work from. Uh, and I'd sort of come up with the usual, right? Aircraft carriers, ballistic missiles, tanks, you know, anything that sounded a bit more interesting, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then I just finished reading a, a, a newspaper article on how crap the SA-80A1 was. 
Um, uh, and I, you know, on a punt, I said, um, small arms. And to my horror, my potential supervisor's eyes lit up. Uh, and um, that was it. I've been stuffed with small arms now for the last, uh, well, since 2003. Um, and, you know, inevitably, um, small arms, well, it wasn't small arms per se that were complicated, but it was how we might think about reading small arms and how we might think about reading technology change and the, the processes associated with technology change, technology change that became, uh, that required quite a bit of time to work through. And really, it was about getting away from, in, for me anyway, it was about getting away from under-theorized approaches and actually starting to realize that, that that binary relationship that I'd initially set up between the engineer and the user, that kind of relationship where, you know, engineers are designed, you know, we build, we'll build a website and they will come. Well, no, no, actually people, you know, it's not just about building a website and hoping that people will come. You have to figure out how to engage the user in a way that, encourages them to come and then engage with the website so that you give them appropriate feedback loops. And there's all sorts of other, obviously, if you're an e-commerce director, you have to do all sorts of clever things to try and persuade people to to, to eventually click and then clickbait turns into money and da, 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 all this kind of stuff. You know, it, 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 there's, it, in, in, in military technology terms, there are an, a number of ways of theorizing those relationships. And, and it was really about trying to understand how those how they might apply in, in, in small arms circumstances. And in that respect, um, uh, the approach I've adopted isn't one that necessarily you would have come across in some of the more mainstream or, more, or some of the more mainstream literatures that you would have read on, on innovation and military innovation. So that's kind of, that's how I've got into it. Um, small arms, did they, I mean, you know, I like, I, they're interesting because they're taboo, right? People, people do stupid things with them. <laughs> You wish they wouldn't, but they do. Uh, and as a result, there's a lot of controversy associated with them. Uh, and that makes them interesting as well. Um, and of course, there's a lot of people write about them, right? And um, the question then is, and of course, also the story is really rather, you know, well known. Everyone knows something, you know, why would you be bothered about small arms? Well, actually, when you take a look again um, and took a, a look really, you know, in a much closer way, and certainly when you start getting into archives and other bits and pieces, you realise that a lot of what people say is utter, can I swear? Am I allowed to swear, Mick? I, I dare not. Is yeah, it, you, can, you can swear. Yeah. It's, it's just bollocks, actually, to be honest. You know, um, the internet has done no good whatsoever for um, people who are, you know, it feeds all sorts of nonsense. I mean, whether it's associated with um, what people do when they die when they're shot or the science of killing or all sorts of other bits and pieces, you know, and um, and certainly social media and the web doesn't, you know, lend itself to that, uh, lend itself to being able to um, uh, tell more informed or meaningful stories, stories that actually can only be um, um, uh, properly uh, understood. You have to go and do some research. You know, it, you really have to get your hands dirty, not with the weapons themselves. Maybe sometimes I've been very lucky in that respect in that I've, got to work with um, people like Richard Jones, who's the editor of Jones Infantry Weapons, who was the former, the last uh, custodian of the MOD Pattern Room, um, which is one of the oldest, um, well, the, the oldest collection of small arms and a very prestigious collection of small arms now associated with the Royal Armouries in Leeds in the United Kingdom. Um, but, you know, people like that keep you true to your sort. You know, they, um, they know these things. They have technical intelligence that, I mean, as in an intelligence officer would have, um, partly because he was in that kind of environment himself. Um, but yeah, the, the kind of technical intelligence that you have to respect and take seriously. Uh, and, um, you know, these pe people like Richard don't go around telling everyone all this stuff. The result is, is people make up all sorts of crap on the internet. Uh, and, and when you look at most gun nut books, with all due respect to gun nuts, because you have to be a gun nut to write a book called Weapon of Choice, I think, um, you have you, you have to um, you, you, you know you do have to go back and think about how to do this systematically, looking at archives, interviewing properly, doing method you know taking proper methodology research methodology and working your way systematically through the the, the material in order to te tell a more coherent and um, 
well, in my case, it's become, you know, a, a more overly theorized um, uh, story. But, you know, there, there are different different people have different ways of approaching um, innovation and what, what floats their boat, really. So, but, that, that, you know, that's the background, if you like. The other interesting thing was the fact that mm, I'd say about 60% of our listeners out there will not understood that you swore when you said bollocks. But uh, let me assure you, listeners, that is 100% considered a swear word when you're in the UK. Sorry. <laughs> I guess we should start off discussing the development of small arms. I'm more interested to understand whether or not the process has been fast or whether it's been slow well in that respect talking about uh, small arms is a bit bizarre isn't it because we know that they've been around for centuries and uh, in terms of their form their weight all sorts of variables that, that you know they, they could hardly be described as the obvious place to go to when trying to think about how innovation works uh, because you know the the major innovations, most you know, when you read most books about um, technology change in the armed forces in the military, you know, you go, uh, you go crossbow, then you go to chevalier and uh, stirrup and lance, and then you might end up with some clever armor of some kind. Then you go to uh, gunpowder, of course, and eventually you'll get into the 19th century. We'll hit uh, breech-loading rifles. We'll we'll go we'll go muskets, breech-loading rifles. We'll talk about uh, particular types of bullet, uh, and then we'll swiftly move to machine guns before machine guns, and then to your obviously your your particular interest. We'll start talking about artillery uh, and uh, how artillery and, and machine guns have revolutionised the battles of the first the battlefields of the First World War, and the rifle suddenly drops out of the picture of anyone's interest when it comes to discussing uh, military technical change. There might there might be a moment where it's sort of about 1890, 1860, 1870. 1880, we start talking about railways and the telegraph and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, we're off to tanks, aircraft, and of course, the, the big one is nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, all of that sounds remarkably compelling, doesn't it? When you're, you know, there's a sort of a logical progression of um, lethality, if you like, from things that aren't very lethal or very effective, um, all the way to a piece of kit that is you know, annihilatory globally, and you know, produces a global annihilation in the form of a, the bomb. And I suppose um, one of the targets, and it's a it's an easy target once you start getting into it. One of the targets of my research is really to sort of start to pick apart this this what I would describe um, as Whiggish or technologically deterministic mode of thinking about technology changes. If you go from lesser forms of technology to ideal forms of technology um, and uh, in order to sort of try and show why those stories don't make sense a rifle is as good a military technology as anyone is any as anything because what it what it shows what it, you can use the rifle for is uh, exploring where the resistance to technological change is um, rather than and I suppose the, the, the in many respects whereas a lot of people are interested in how technology change can be promoted, how innovation can be promoted. A lot of what I'm interested in is what are the things that hold it back, and why. You know, where it, I'm very much interested in the, um, the the gutter politics, if you like, of technology change, uh, because it's in those counter narratives about what hasn't worked and why, and what bits of kit could have come off but got sunk as a result of some kind of uh, 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 story, um, a counter story by a, a, a different team that didn't particularly like this piece of kit. Um, uh, how that, that, how those narratives emerge, and how they play out in a number of different contexts, um, and show that things that you take for granted about military professions being. Um, I mean, well, firstly, of course, there's the the trope that the military are conservative and incapable of change and all the rest of it. And I, I've never considered that to be necessarily the case. I mean, clearly there are moments where, like any institution, it, preserve, it, it will protect its particular practices and work in particular ways. Um, 
but when you trace the stories about individual, I mean, the point about taking a gun is it's very simple. A rifle is very simple. You can trace the discussions across the organisation because you know it's only it's, it doesn't it's not very sophisticated. There are only 120 components maybe in a in a rifle, um, and so bearing that mind and that in mind, you can trace the stories about these things across the organisation, and you can see who in the organization and we're not just talking about the army here we're talking about engineers scientists bureaucrats alliance partners industry we can see who's talking about it in a particular way um, and you get a different you get a different interpretation about um, how change is working across the military from its partners that actually make the, the technologies that put, get, end up in the hands of soldiers all the way through the different layers and levels of the organization of the various organizations that are involved in bringing that piece of kit uh, onto the battlefield. Um, and it's, it, it, it's an assumption, it seems to me, that when we talk about military innovation, that um, these pieces of kit just sort of appear as if there's no debate, you know, that there might not be any winners and losers in the process of this kit appearing. Uh, and, you know, which industrial partner is going to win <laughs> any contract? as if they haven't got an, a, a stake in the process, as if they haven't got a stake in shaping the way the process in, unfolds in order to guarantee that their kit gets selected. So you, you can, once I start spinning the story the other way around, this notion that um, there's this obvious progression from lower forms of technology to more sophisticated forms of technology starts to, you know, you need to start treating that, that narrative with some caution. Um, because there's a lot of there is a lot of small p politics, if you like, that uh, are, are working in the in the back channels that shape particular ways of um, uh, of working. From um, I mean, you know, just from the artifact technology as an artifact, all the way through to the process of making the technology or making the technology work in a particular circumstance, uh, or the know-how associated with getting the technology to work in a particular way. Uh, all of those, there's a lot of different moving parts. Uh, I was very lucky one time to be uh, take, flown onto the uh, US Navy's um, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, and that is a complex piece of kit. Um, and orchestrating all of those pieces, th those, different, those different things, you know, it takes, it's really sophisticated. Tracing how innovation works in that environment, given the complexity of that platform, you know, would require, if I ended up writing a, a book of, I don't know, 100,000 words, you know, to, to do what I did with small arms for a, a system, a system, systems of systems like an aircraft carrier like that, I think could be, you know, a sizable volume if you took my approach. But I think there's lots to commend my approach. One of the biggest issues with nuclear powered aircraft carriers compared to rifles is that you can't strip and assemble an aircraft carrier in 60 seconds and uh if you could well your drill sergeant would be pretty proud of you at the time <laughs> so just just uh listening to the way you've described the narratives and you know what we traditionally think in fact what is taught in history uh classes in schools probably around the world this evolution um of military technology it's still taking quite a while for small arms to, I suppose, develop uh, and mature. There's other advances in science that have gone along hand in hand with it, um, although don't tell the infantry that science is involved in small arms. But why do you think it's taken so long to, or had, did it take long? Did people have a focus on the small arm or were they trying to increase that distance between themselves and uh, those they sought to do harm. So it's a legitimate question to say that the, battle, the nature of um, winning battles is different in that actually we, we need to be thinking about uh, uh, your, your interests, your in, interest in artillery, um, uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, you know, distance is clearly a Western preference for um, fighting uh, 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 wars. Uh, of course, it all sorts to fall down when you fight insurgencies. Um, at which point, actually, um, small arms are really rather important for helping just manage the population, police the population, control the population. Um, um, 
and just to pick up the point, you know, is there science involved in small arms? Um, absolutely there is. Um, and the science associated with lethality is, of course, contested. Um, there is people people spend a lot of time talking in terms speaking in terms of kinetic effects. Um, uh, infantry officers, you know, military types will talk about kinetic effects, but that that's rooted in um, a scientific investigation during the Second World War into how to produce um, more lethal effects. And of course, what you find is is that British scientists and American scientists during the Second World War had a completely different perspective of what produced lethality. Uh, um, British scientists would look at lethality in terms of momentum effects. Americans were keen to retain kinetic energy as a, a mode of describing lethality. Um, and for all sorts of structural reasons associated with American investment in science and in sci the science associated with um, lethality, and the Brits withdrawing from doing primary research in lethality, you start to start to realise why Americans might be able to dominate debates about how we would define lethality. Um, and it becomes a structural question about lethality being understood in terms of kinetic effects rather than momentum effects. But, you know, those narratives, it could have, if, if the investment had been in a different place, you know, you could see those narratives working out in a different way. And there's something about, I suppose, and that's the key to my book, there's something about the relationship between these these modes of analysis and and how power might work within the organization you know in 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 crude terms lethality debates were framed by americans willingness to put money into investigating lethality and brits being unwilling to do that uh, and no wonder you get to various nato standardization debates and the rest of it and the criteria for defining lethality and ammunition choice are dictated by on, along american lines um, uh, ruling out uh, British variants like the 485 in the 1970s or caseless ammunition that the Germans were working on uh, in the 1970s or any other uh, odd variety or variant that, you know, the Americans had developed 556. They wanted everyone to use 556. Uh, interestingly, though, there are, uh, were ways of subverting that narrative came, came about as a result of um, industry, uh, Fabrique Nationale, uh, uh, working in uh, having a, a, a particularly fascinating strategy for unpicking the American and, and American approach, which ultimately um, was connected to their desire to sell FN Mini Me to the Americans. So they effectively um, uh, um, uh, designed uh, uh, ammunition that would work particularly well in their FN Mini Me. And because the Americans wanted to buy FN Mini Me, you know, they, they realized that they should adopt the Belgian version of 556 rather than the. And of course, it kept Europeans happy and it kept the Americans happy just about. Of course, that also led to the uh, uh, iteration of the M16 to the A2 version because they had to read. The Americans were very annoyed about having to rebarrel their, 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 their weapons to stop fouling and all of it. But. Um, uh, your 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 first question was about um, maturing incrementally, if I remember correctly, which is where I was trying to get to. And of course, I allowed myself to rabbit on. Um, um, you, I think what I've alluded to just in that last uh, um, five minutes or so is that actually one of the reasons why technologies don't change is because they can they they are the physical representation of a series of bargains that go on within the military organization now you know in britain um and i think to a lesser extent in the us you tell me in australia but i imagine it's um uh, pretty much the same there the introduction of every small arm into uh, army service has been associated with some kind of controversy uh, from uh, 1870, the, the Martini Henry being replaced, it, of course, it failed in the Sudan. The Lee Metford came along. Uh, you go through to the SMLE. The SMLE it, it was a 303 round. It didn't, you know, there were lots of people in Britain who didn't think it worked. 303 rounds worked particularly well in, in Afghanistan. And so the dum dum controversy um, emerged. Um, you move forward, you have the uh, EM2, the experimental model number two, uh, and the SLR. 
a huge amount of controversy associated with that. And of course, you have over the last, well, the, the, the Enfield weapon system, which was the precursor to the SA-80, came out, uh, was first mooted in the early 70s. And it took until, what, 2000, 2001, before the British Army had a properly working SA-80A2. So that was only, what, I don't know, 30 odd years of of farting about trying to get a piece of kit into the soldiers' hands that might actually do the job that they needed to do. Um, but you've got to remember that each one of these technologies has a huge amount of bargaining going on in, in, into it. You know, um, I realise that when um, users present engineers with a set of requ a user requirement, it, it's it's one set of it's a it's one document, but that that document is. The, the, the result of a whole series of bargains across regiments, across units, who uh, amongst people who have potentially, at least, completely conflicting different ta interpretations of the tactical engagement. And, I mean, this is really rather obvious in places like um, uh, um, the Second... You can see this really clearly in the Second World War. Uh, the, Brits, the, 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 the Brits were definitely through the director of infantry, um, uh, through the battle school movement, um, were keen to try and pursue a more, um, I'm trying to think of the right word now, my brain has just seized up. They were trying to think of, uh, uh, they, they were absolutely interested in adopting more uh, appropriate fire and movement um, uh, uh, tactics. You know, this was, the, 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 the kinds of things that, you know, you would have you would have learned maybe on the First World War that were difficult to implement in a non-professional army, um, and of course, um, that perspective was not something that um, senior leaders in the British Army were keen to uh, engage with when they had started to perfect during the uh, North Africa campaign and into Sicily, and I'm thinking in particular Montgomery. They were starting to perfect. The operational techniques that would allow them to do precisely what you said earlier, which was to combine arms in a particular way in sequencing, in sequencing them, and then start to win the engagement at an operational level. There is, you know, why why sacrifice your men on the altar of the, on the altar of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, tactical tactical efficiency when actually you can win the engagement at a distance, coordinating blows, bringing different units and services and uh, combined arms together in order to achieve the same result, um, especially if it keeps losses down and, you know, you're winning. Um, so th there was one instance of a, a tactical engagement, of a, of a tactical versus an operational engagement that, that was at, uh, uh, at odds. But, you know, if you just look at things in terms of uh, marksmanship and firepower, um, the, the, the U.S. had a particular, they were particularly wedded to marksmanship um, uh, just as the Brits were experimenting, certain parts of the Brits were experimenting, uh, communities within the British uh, military were experimenting with fire and movement and the technologies that might enable tactical flexibility. That's not to say that the Americans themselves weren't engaged in that, but, you know, frontline commanders were wedded to the M1 Garand, they were wedded to uh, marksmanship type techniques, and, you know, effectively there was a, a, a congruence between British and American operational technique you know, broadly conceived, that, that kept innovations locked on, uh, in a particular way on the battlefield. But, you know, um, innovative technologies, uh, you'd expect to be uh, uh, machine guns and the rest of it, things that require independent choice. Uh, um, you'd expect to, an independent thinking, leadership, if you like. Um, you'd expect to come from societies that um, valued um, democracy and um, uh, 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 the surprising thing is, of course, is that the the, the places that adopted the what is commonly discussed as the uh, ideal small arm, the the assault rifle, the, the countries that adopted those first were Nazi Germany and uh, the Soviet Union, um, and you know Brits and Americans wedded to professional armed forces looked at marksmanship is more important than um ultimately than uh, uh the, the firepower the, the flexibility that came out of assault rifles um but you know there, there were debates between the americans and brits about how to best prosecute this this the tactical engagement 
And I suppose that's the first step. You know, users themselves struggle sometimes to come to a agreed position. And one that is agreed may not just be an agreement. It may be a diktat. You know, someone's actually, you know, people roll into a job, they roll out of a job over two years. In those two years, they dictate what the policy will be. Another person comes in, you know, things start to change. Um, uh, um, even once you've handed over the user requirement, assuming that um, that is settled and there are no arguments or debates within the user community, let, let make that assumption, you still have to go to engineers. And of course, engineers have different views about what the technical solution might look like for the user community. And of course, you can put it through trials and all the rest of it. But once you get from the engineer, say you've got a technical problem. I mean, this, in my, what I fix on is, is lethality. You have two technical solutions in, in, in the 1940s and late 1940s and 50s. Brits have a view, the Americans have a view. How do you resolve which one's best? They go and talk to scientists. But the problem, is, the problem is, is, of course, scientists have different views about what lethality might mean. Hence my point about kinetic, you know, my observation earlier about kinetic uh, uh, effects and momentum effects. So if scientists can't even tell you what the best is, then how the hell do you tell what the best is? Right? We're trying to get the best bit of kit into the soldier's hands. Um, users aren't sure. They've, come, they've given us a user requirement. It's, it looks like it's settled. Um, we'll give it to the engineers. We've got engineers trying to protect their particular pet theories or their approaches. Um, you know, after the Second World War, uh, it, the Americans and the Brits were forced into a situation, a sort of pre-NATO uh, relationship. This is where it starts to become about defence industrial policy. Whoever won those standardisation debates after the Second World War, um, ultimately uh, they would have the opportunity to... Um, I mean, ultimately, uh, it, this reached deep into defence industrial policy, because if you define the standard, then potentially you could dictate uh, uh, the terms in which others would build bits of kit. Uh, and you might find that your, uh, you could protect your defence industrial base more effectively by dictating the standards. Um, uh, you get to scientists, same problem. You go from scientists, though. The interesting thing about the scientists' challenges uh, and lethality is that um, lethality wasn't, uh, was ultimately um, something that wasn't defined by scientists themselves. It had to be a bureaucratic response. Bureaucrats had to make up their mind because decisions had to be made. Scientists might not, be agree, might not agree, but you need to crack on and get a decision made about what kit you're going to put in the hands of the soldier. You may disagree with it, but you need to crack on. And then it comes down to structural power, you know, as I was alluding to earlier. Um, I, I suppose ultimately, uh, um, you know, my my penultimate uh, chapter, my 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 final chapter is about saying, even when you start to run these things through alliance partners, once you've got past that, and everyone's had their say as to what might work for them as. Uh, uh, an alliance partner as an individual nation, you've still got to engage with industry and um, industry has got to come out and design something and build something that, um, that, that, that the user might um, want. And, you know, my real conclusion in this respect is to suggest that actually over the last 20 or so years, um, the engineering community within government has become certainly in the UK, maybe in the US, I don't know how it is in Australia, but um, uh, certainly become hollowed out. So you don't have enough experts within government themselves to evaluate, to scrutinise and evaluate designs. Um, and so you get a user community that actually is, a, is, is given the opportunity to, to buy what it wants. Um, certainly the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and three urgent operational requirements and various other things. You can, buy, you can buy what you want, but there's no evaluation as to, there's, no, there's insufficient oversight to make sure that it, 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 it has, um, that it, it is actually fit for purpose or that it might work on the longer, on the, in the longer term or that it fits within the nation's priorities overall. Uh, and the question I have is, is, you know, given that there's a, a sort of a, a hollowing out of engineering expertise, um, 
how does it has industry exploited this? And and my view is is that actually absolutely it has. Industry has worked very hard to shape the choices of the user community in such a way as to turn the user community into a consumer. So soldiers aren't picking what they think. You know this effectiveness debate that you can you might have about kit is only one half of it. You know actually it's effectiveness and fashion. You know, and you have uh, military fashions, um, and the most obvious would be uh, digital patterns in uh, camouflage. Um, but the same applies to small arms. And there are a number of people who have widgets and, you know, Picatinny rails with all sorts of uh, sights and stocks and grips and, you know, God knows what. Um, uh, you know, and, and they start to influence what people think is the most appropriate, and of course, that's most easily done through special for the special forces community, who have independent budgets, who can go around the world and buy the bits of kit that they want for the specific operations that they want. Um, and you know, you don't have to. Be, if you're if you're Green Army, it doesn't take much to um, if you see one of these guys, you look at the, the Gucci gear that these um, these guys have, and um, uh, you want you you realise that if you want some Gucci gear, you have to either be SF or you, uh, uh, the SF community, or um, work in a uh, in an elite regiment, or you have to try and put pressure on the uh, procurement guys to get the the kind of the kind of gear that that everyone else has. So you kind of it creates this status anxiety, and status anxiety I think can be easily exploited by industry. You can you can sell gear. Uh, uh, um, in ways that shape demand, um, and demand and shape demand in a way that isn't always um, most appropriate for the for in terms of um, what makes sense strategically, what makes sense systematically or organisationally, in terms of logistics, training, supply chain, all this kind of stuff. Right? Now, Matthew, I uh, would love to sit here and talk all day about my personal views on the SA eighty A two. Uh, or uh, maybe posit some of the theories put forward to me about why I'm using the wrong rifle uh, when I go hunting, or posit some of the theories that have been put to me on why the militaries use the wrong sort of weapons these days as compared to the SLR from Vietnam. However, we do have one more question to ask, and it's a question that all my guests get, and it's not related to small arms. It's related to our mission. It's related to Big Carl's mission. And it's about mm. defining and debating war. Each guest gets to finish the sentence, war is. So I ask you, our smallest of armed guests so far, <laughs> can you finish the sentence, war is? Yeah, I've been thinking about this question. It's not an easy question to ask uh, uh, to answer. And, I, you know, I like to write short sentences, even though I was prattling on there for a good, I don't know how long it was, half an hour. Um, um, I, I was, I, I've thought about this, and I've got sort of, there are obviously sophisticated answers, which involve going to read lots of books. Um, and then there was a sort of flippant, or semi-flippant, but, you know, alluding to... Um, um, the, the challenges, and I think I, I, I kept coming back to uh, war is war is complex, and don't do it too often. That is what <laughs> I that 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 really was. Um, you know, uh, it, it it seems to me that um, it's an instrument of power, and it's not going anywhere. It got not going away anytime soon. Uh, and it, it makes some sense to spend some time thinking about it carefully um, uh, because, uh, you know, if, if it starts, you ha we have to be very, very careful about um, uh, knowing what we're getting into um, because it just, uh, I, don't, I mean, I, you know, I can wax philosophical here and I think that was the, half the challenge, right? You've given me a, a philosophical question that I need to stop myself from becoming too philosophical <laughs> over. At the that's, end of the interview, stop talking. <laughs> that's a trick. That's a trick. Uh, a lot of guests get trapped in that. We don't ask them to finish the paragraph or the book. We just ask them to finish a sentence. It's a, it's complex 
task to complete, but war is complex and don't do it too often is quite a good uh, response. I think our listeners will get a bit of a kick out of that. Now, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been very interesting listening to the details and changing, I know, my personal perspective on how we've had developments in the small arms area across the global uh, military world. So, Matthew, thank you very much for coming on the show, and I hope the book goes well. Listeners, you can follow Matthew on War Matters in uh, the Twitter sphere if you are a Twitter person. If you are not a Twitter person, get on Twitter and then follow him anyway. Follow us, then follow him. Matthew, thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Listeners, now we have another review coming up next week. I'm going to keep that format happening so that I can keep you both updated and give you a little bit more content this year because I know how fast and voracious you are at consuming information. But until next time, listeners, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website, www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution Licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.